Hey everyone, welcome to Nerding IO. We've been testing out ChatGPT Vision recently. We actually came up with 10 different use cases that you can use as developers today. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so keep in mind, we're doing tests that will specifically help uh, software developers. And the first one that we came up with was this idea of taking a logo and getting some feedback. So what I did is I just took the, the Nerding IO logo and I asked it for color theory, symmetry, and other design principles. And this is what it came back with. It's really interesting. It gives uh, the, the color choice, you know, it being vibrant, the emotion that's associated with it, talks about the symmetry, uh, goes into the typography, even noting that the IO has a nice touch. Uh, the imagery of the glasses goes with the nerd stereotype, uh, white space composition, uh, the simplicity. It even talks about how it's uh, clean and able to be used in, in different uh, ways. So like uh, works well with grayscale and on different backgrounds. So that was really cool to, to kind of just put it in like a, a logo test for design. You could probably do the same thing with uh, a web page as well. So this got me thinking about, all right, let's, let's really try and go after some technical pieces. So the next piece example was trying to do SEO. And again, we're going to be using just Nerding IO. So using the Nerding IO website, I, I actually did act as a SEO specialist to see if I could get some different results and ask for specific examples. And it actually did. Not only did it recognize the title, but it talking about like keywords and then associating the H1 tags, the uh, descriptive of the text. Uh, it says include relevant words without stuffing, which I thought was interesting. Talks about internal linking, even some uh, WCAG stuff here, making sure that they're all of the alt tags, which this also gave me a good idea. And talking about the file names, right? Like making sure that they're descriptive instead of just image one. Then it starts to talk about some of the uh, areas where there could be some clarity. Talks about a little bit about the UX. This also gave me another idea. And then talks about metadata. So this is actually really interesting things that like you could go back and look at. And, and talks about very specific examples from the... Uh, YouTube channel to, to the images. So based on that, the next one that we did was the uh, WCAG. So acting as a web accessibility expert and evaluating the page for WCAG standards and highlighting uh, you know, some non-compliance or fixes. Again, asking it for specific examples. So it talks about the contrast right out of the gate. This could be super helpful. Some of these things I'm sure are through, you could figure out through um, like Chrome and Lighthouse and, and uh, Axe and things like that. But it's, it's pretty interesting. It's even talking about like the three to one for larger text and the ratios. That's really cool. Uh, talking about the, the site should be responsive. Again, we're, you know, mentioning the alt text, talking about keyboard accessibility um, going down into like audio, if any, uh, talking about like link descriptions, all of these things. And then I think it's pretty cool that it was talking about error handling as well. Now it doesn't give a score or anything, but still, this is almost like a good checklist that you could use just right out of the gate by ju just by taking like a screenshot of your website and putting it into ChatGPT vision. So again, you know, it started making me think, uh, like when suggesting focus and indication and stuff like that, like what about UX? So that's the next one we're gonna look at. So using the same image, now we're, I actually made it a little simpler, just saying offer feedback, uh, but still giving like specific examples. I wanted to call out the image. So it starts talking about clear hierarchy, it's talking about the CTA, uh, the informational flow, which is definitely interesting actually pulls out specific interface elements. So talking about the navigation, the illustrations, um, and typography, 
right? The color scheme, again, the YouTube section is being brought up. Um, and then gives a long, long list of potential enhancements. So talking about responsiveness again and search functionality, um, hover events, testimonials, right? Like this is, this is almost like marketing as well. And then, uh, you know, the footer, the loading speed. So now we're talking about performance. Um, again, bringing up accessibility, that's awesome. Even specifically calling out WCAG without even being instructed to. Uh, and then these are the specific examples that it's talking about uh, maybe addressing. So very cool, you know, talking about hover animations and things. All right, so this next one, uh, I had the idea of taking that same image, but then seeing if we could do a lark and, uh, light and dark mode. And so when I first did the light and dark mode, what it did is uh, it gave, it came up with like our base styles, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, even looking at like the button transition, understanding like the margin for the container. And then it did it where it basically has class names associated to each one. So we can see like the colors that it's pulling out of that. Um, and even with dark mode, it's same thing. It has the class attached to each element. And that, while that's great, and it even comes up with like the toggle, so you can toggle between the two. Um, that's not necessarily what I wanted. I wanted it to actually uh, detect what the mode was for and write all the CSS for the page. So I tried that, and it's using the perfs color scheme. And what it's doing is, again, it's doing the, the base styles. It added a header, uh, so it's trying to do a little bit of better association with the image. Um, light mode, by default, this almost seems a little redundant, but that's all right. Um, and then it's going into this media, and it's actually saying the prefers color schema and when it's associated with dark. So it's using this. So that like based on your uh, your system, it'll actually change from light to dark mode and then you can you can actually customize it. So that's pretty interesting that it was able to figure that out. Again, it's trying to write the HTML. It was kind of cool that it actually you know was pulling key elements out of there. Obviously didn't pull any the image tags, just did like um, web accessibility h1s and, and things like that. But I think for if you wanted to, you know, take screenshots of your web page and try and have it do some basic styling for even like good contrast of what your your light and dark mode should look like. This might be a good way to to kind of test it out. So with that, we're going to go into a little bit more code, and we'll jump over to the uh, to the next one. So what I did is, uh, again, using a YouTube example, I looked at the code that I had open in that screen. And I just asked, what is the code doing? Just trying to see if it could break some of that down and actually explain it to me. So this actually includes code that has LangChain, which is not in ChatGPT's um, you know, knowledge base. And so it did recognize certain things, you know, like import statements. It recognized that it was using React. It also recognized that it was using Next.js. Uh, going down into like the prompt function, even calling out the API calls. This I thought was really cool. It even noticed that it was a sidebar and then specifically called out that the structure it has was Next.js based on the folders. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying these use cases with ChatGPT Vision. I just wanted to ask really quickly, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe. It helps more than you know, and leave us any comments that you think of what you wanna see next. So next, I kinda of wanted to trip this up, and I wanted to see if I could just take that same piece of code and make it fail. And so I just put in this uh, undefined variable just called fail. And I uh, I just asked what's wrong with this code, didn't give it a, a role or, or any other kind of pointers. And it actually came up with some pretty interesting stuff. So the first thing, it obviously 
figured out, you know, that uh, an unexplained fail keyword, it's not part of the JavaScript statement. Um, it also actually found that the prompt template is not used, which I thought was pretty cool. And you could maybe say like, oh, because it's not showing up, it's different. Um, but then it keeps going. And this one was kind of interesting that like on line 22, you are using prompt format and it's not clear where prompt is coming from. So this is kind of a mistake, but kind of an interesting one at the same time, because prompt is actually, uh, it commented out. And so that's why prompt template isn't getting called. But later it's thinking that this is actually running, even though that's commented out. So it's kind of an error, but kind of an interesting error. The next part talking about the undefined function or method uh, prevent default. Um, then it's talking about environment variables. This one I also thought was really cool. It recognized a best practice that even though I'm doing a fetch call, it doesn't have a try catch block. And so best practices would state that we would have that and be able to uh, do, you know, a results uh, return specifically and probably also do a console error. Um, also talking about the the endpoints uh, and then the setting the state. Um, but again, it had the unused imports, which I thought was super cool because this information is actually commented out. And then it even talks about the comments themselves. And I don't know that these lines are correct, but it actually did call out the fact that there is uh, comments that need to be or there are comments that need to be commented out. And then goes on to discuss that the first thing to, to fix is the fail statement, which is accurate. So again, I thought this was really cool that you could actually uh, do some debugging uh, and give it and get some best practices. So the next one is a little different. What we're gonna do is we're actually gonna take what this code represents and take a look at that. And so for this one, this is the actual website. It's just a, uh, a input and a submit that goes and runs a lang chain process. And so what was cool about this is that it's, it, it has the nerding at the top. It talks about the submit button. It's, and we're making, uh, we're taking a stat up mockup and actually looking at like how we could make this better. We've seen some examples of like drawing on a piece of paper and actually building this code out, but I want to just take a static website and just say, as a developer, what are some things that we can do to make this better? And so we start seeing the interactivity. We talk about the submit button. It talks about the tooltip as a helper icon. I thought that was pretty inter interesting. Talks about a progress loader or indicator. Uh, some feedback, so some error handling would be a best practice. Again, this doesn't even know about the code. It's just looking at a flat file of the web page. It talks about keyboard accessibility. This is the third time that we've seen it bring up WCAG and then responsive design for the UI as well. I, I just think that's really cool. Even a dark mode toggle, uh, that's pretty interesting. And then an auto complete feature. So I wanted to take it a step further and say, could you code these in Next.js and Tailwind? And so it goes through actually building out the project and then it's using uh, pages. So it's not using the app router, but still, I mean, this code is, is definitely working. It does a mock so that you can actually do the indicator and the progress testing. It's got accurate placeholders. Um, you can even see like the loading for the button itself, as well as doing a styling change there, and then tells you how to do your configuration. All right, so on the last two, I was super surprised and also tried to trick it. So I took this old picture of Super Mario Brothers on NES, and I was kind of just seeing if it would actually help me beat the game. That's why I put in and ways to test. However, what it did is by identifying improvements and then the identity balance, balance issues, it actually acted as a game designer or developer, looking at this 
and trying to figure out specifically like the varying types of shapes. So it recognized the platforms. It understands that, you know, maybe instead of having Mario just sit there, as soon as it stands on him, it has to drop. It talks about enemy variety. It talks about the power-ups and blocks. It even goes on to talk about how Mario is encouraged to explore and to have some sort of vertical gameplay. The the next ones I thought were super interesting. So it's talking about almost like gamer fatigue. So if the level is long, incorporating checkpoints to make sure that the user doesn't get frustrated or if they die. And this also this idea of having a breather or safe areas. Again, I just thought that was incredibly cool that it actually went through a ways to like improve as a game designer uh, just by an image and then talking about ways to engage with the player. And as far as test uh, testing goes, it kind of talks about just ways to, you know, continuously iterate and observe and provide feedback and have uh, diverse player skill levels, right? So easy, medium, hard. Um, so this was this one was a lot of fun to see in action. It was definitely a little different. And it really inspired me for the last one. So the last one's a little bit out there, but I figured we might as well just go big or go home. And what I, I did was I took three different images and I said, all right, analyze these real world, real world images and suggest virtual augmentations. So basically, if you were looking at the world and you had AR goggles or, or an AR, AR interface, what would you what would it suggest to interact with? And I gave it, you know, a busy city, a park setting, and just like a home. And this was super cool. It talks about having holographic street signs above the road, pointing out directions, superimposed floating ads or billboards in the sky, uh, robots and futuristic characters could be walking alongside real people. Um, on the butter, on the flower garden, it talks about, you know, almost making it a fantasy land with, you know, butterflies and that land on flowers and mythical creatures, uh, you know, and just rainbows and, and all kinds of just, it says it right here, a magical ambience. So I thought that was really interesting and fun. And then the last part was the, uh, the living room, right? And so it's talking about how interactive screens on the walls could be used for video calls, browsing or entertainment. You have virtual pets, um, even a virtual fish tank. And then even give something that you can interact with, which would be the coffee table could have a virtual magazine that you could flip through. So again, it really pushed the limits of how we could use this tool as developers, designers, and really start thinking of unique ways to take still images and try and push the limits of what we're doing in software. All right, I hope you enjoyed those use cases. We went through everything from like SEO and WCAG to some pretty interesting and like obscure ideas related to AR and even game design, which kind of came out of nowhere in my opinion. So if you like this content, again, please like and subscribe. We're gonna leave an upcoming video specifically about the tips and tools we used in order to kind of make this quickly. And with that, we'll see you in the next one. Happy nerding.